But you're meant to be yourself. You're a beautiful creation of God. And being holy, my fellow graduates, means being you, not another person. We look often to other people for a roadmap of who we're supposed to be when all the directions you need are right inside of you, planted there by God. Man or woman, young or old, black, brown or white, short or tall, gay or straight or lesbian or transgender, you are beautiful. Remember, God does not make crap. So the idea that someone would come out you know, and be honest and transparent and open about the way that God created them, I think is terrific. You know, I think that's something that the Catholic Church can support. Colonel Reinhard Marx of Munich had a great quote uh, I think it was about a week ago, right when that first report came out. And he said, what this synod is teaching us is that maybe Catholic families have never been what we thought they would be. I think that the two words that came up uh, for me, for many people, uh, but particularly encapsulated things were accompanying, mm -hmm. which uh, the Pope had talked about, we need to accompany people. He said that in his interview with America Magazine and other Jesuit magazines. And this idea, this famous idea now, which I'm sure you're getting a lot of comments on that I'd like to hear what a theologian has to say, the law of gradualism. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist's model is essentially conversion first, think about it, right, the baptism of repentance, and then communion. So you, 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 you repent, you convert, and then you are welcomed into the community. Ben Myers said, which I found fascinating, is that Jesus' daring insight was to have communion first, and then conversion, right? So you think of someone like Zacchaeus, right? Jesus sees Zacchaeus in the Gospel of Luke in the tree and says, come down, today I must die in your house. Well, that's communion. I am, I am part of the, your community. He hasn't converted yet. Mm -hmm. And then through that action, Zacchaeus says, if I have defrauded anyone, I will pay him or her four times over. Mm -hmm. So it's, and I thought when I was listening to the bishops that some of them favored Conversion first, you know, these people have to do this, whoever they are, mm -hmm. cohabitating couples, you know, LGBT, divorced, remarried, whoever. Yeah. And then communion. The other side I heard was communion, no, bring them in, welcome them, gradualism, it's okay, we accompany them, and then we move them along. So one was the kind of John the Baptist way, one was the Jesus way, I think. Now, I think Pope Francis is more... Uh, communion first and then conversion, but for someone who's doing conversion first and then communion, it can be a very uh, surprising change. The problem where the law of gradualism has been applied to Catholic LGBT ministries, the result has been a several decade long entrenchment of unchecked and mutually encouraged dissent, with Catholic gay ministries celebrating everything from gay pride to the 2015 Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage, with several ministries going as far as holding meetings at local gay bars. A particularly well-known, predominantly gay parish in San Francisco, which perhaps has the longest history of gay affirmation of any other parish in the U.S., is still fomenting wide divergences from even the most basic Catholic teachings regarding homosexuality. In 2015, the National Catholic Reporter profiled Most Holy Redeemer in a series of glowing articles. Several married gay parishioners were interviewed and profiled. One man, a parishioner for 18 years, is married to his same-sex partner. Another parishioner for two decades is also married to his same-sex partner. And another, a woman who is a same-sex marriage advocate and has been at the parish since the 1990s. An openly gay parishioner, who was also interviewed at Most Holy Redeemer, said the following, Some people have in mind a certain end result in the church. Some want same-gender couples married in the church. Some want women on the altar. I don't know when this will be possible. And he continued, but I don't want to wait for a pope 
or a bishop to say something is okay. If we are the body of Christ, we have to start right now. Upon his assignment to Most Holy Redeemer in 2015, the former pastor said, we didn't come here to change anybody. In 2016, Most Holy Redeemer posted the following answer to a Facebook question regarding the term intrinsically disordered. And they wrote, Most Holy Redeemer is located in the Castro District of San Francisco. Our congregation is 65 to 75 percent LGBTQ. Many of our parishioners are married to their same-sex partners and have adopted children which are baptized at our parish. By the way, none of the parishioners feel that we are intrinsically disordered, and we have told that to the Archbishop. Akoyere, um, first, you know, on Monday, we got that Relazio, it's on the front page of the Times, welcome to gays, and this extraordinary language. And I have to say, I want to say for the record, I don't think the media made too much of this. This was, in fact, a change. You know, there are a lot of uh, people who were saying, you know, this is baloney, it's all the media. No, this was a big change. Welcome, partners, precious love. It was astonishing. I never re read or heard uh, language like that. Um, but then what happened is certain of the English-speaking bishops changed the translation of atelier, welcome or embrace, as you were saying, to providing for it. I mean, even even with like the, the Vatican's uh, spokesperson and, and and these bishops getting up and saying that last document, Cardinal uh, Napier from Durban, South Africa, that last document is irredeemable. And then Cardinal Marx being asked about the development of doctrine, which up until I don't know three years ago was kind of controversial. That absolutely. So of course it does. Of course doctrine develops. And obviously, you know, we can be able to we can change our teaching on these things. Well, and even the word change has been used. I know. Uh, and Particularly with synods, um, it was usually thought that synods, and this is nothing new, synods and Episcopal conferences did not sort of reach their, their what, was, what Vatican II had laid out for them. Mm -hmm. as, as conferences, deliberative conferences on their own, not simply rubber stamps, basically, right? And Pope Francis was in favor from the very beginning of what he called synodality, right? He's very concern with this collegial nature, it's very from Vatican II, where the bishops help the Pope decide. To, to quote my former editor, uh, Tom Rees, the bishops are not simply branch managers of the headquarters, mm -hmm. which is how we sometimes think of them. They are leaders and teachers in their own right, and bishops' conferences have a certain authority, you know? I was gonna say, there's that beautiful story that came out about the Australian couple yeah. who talked about their friends whose gay son invited his partner to the Christmas dinner. Um, and, and this Australian couple said, wasn't that a wonderful way of showing the love that they have for their son and for his partner? Uh, and the fact that the word partner is being used uh, in, in, in that room, in the Vatican, uh, and then it appeared in the first draft document, that's showing uh, a phenomenal acceptance of the terms that people use to describe each other. Yeah, and I also think the other thing as you're talking about that, you know, the response that that garnered, yeah. which was almost, which, which was almost immediate uh, response from a certain group of uh, bishops, you know, who were horrified by that language. What the Pope has to do, of course, is to bring the whole church uh, along, and he can't leave certain groups behind, he can't leave certain geographic groups, be, groups behind, and so I think the idea of progressing without kind of splitting things up is very is very central for, for what he's trying to do. Uh, and so, you know, good luck to him. I mean, please pray for him. Well, I mean, grappling with the world as it is, you know, yeah. that, that one of the things I was always taught, uh, I've been with Jesuits since high school, that there's this Ignatian pedagogical paradigm, a teaching paradigm, that starts off with where is the student? Mm -hmm. and, and the goal is not to say, oh, bad student, look at this nasty place you're in, let me try to help you out of it but let me understand who you are in that place and let me see God in you in that place. The main Thing that he is sort of recommending or encouraging priests and pastoral workers and everyone who works with the church to do is, is this accompaniment. 
Uh, and that's very much part of Amoris Laetitia. In for Jesus, it's more often than not community first, you're welcome, and then some sort of conversion. Now, I'm not saying that LGBT people are, you know, ipso facto, ipso facto sinful. And to kind of continue this culture of encounter and accompaniment, basically. Mm -hmm. Some parishes have very uh, specific and formal and vibrant LGBT outreach. Uh, there's a parish right around the corner from here called the Church of St. Paul the Apostle that has a group called Out at St. Paul's. I mean, you know, it's very obviously an LGBT group. Out at St. Paul is a gay affirmative LGBT ministry located at the mother house of the Paulist Fathers, St. Paul the Apostle Church, in the Archdiocese of New York. They regularly celebrate gay pride masses to coincide with the raucous New York City Pride Parade. They have also promoted articles about queering Mary and your favorite gay saints, claiming that saints Perpetua and Felicity were actually lesbian lovers. In a recent post, James Martin responded to a Facebook comment with, You may be surprised when you get to heaven to be greeted by LGBT men and women. This attitude goes part and parcel with his obsession for lecturing various church leaders that, in his judgment, should only discuss homosexuality using pre-approved terms, in effect dictating the frame of reference for the conversation before it even begins. Yet in a speech to the dissident group New Ways Ministry, Martin said that Jesus saw beyond categories. Yet Martin chooses to even label those in heaven as LGBT. Another article promoted by Out at St. Paul advanced the idea of gay kinky sex as a way to God. Here is an excerpt. Whether a relationship lasts a lifetime or only a few minutes, what might it mean to see the Christ in each person we encounter? From some people that will look like decades of monogamous togetherness, for others that might mean a kinky romp in a dungeon complete with paddles and consensual name calling. On September 23, 2016, out at St. Paul commemorated the Obergefell versus Hodges Supreme Court decision with two featured guests. They included the Director of Catholic Initiatives for the Pro-Gay Human Rights Campaign and a Catholic school teacher who was let go from her job after it was discovered that she was married to another woman. In an announcement for the event, out at St. Paul provided the following details. After Obergefell versus Hodges, the Supreme Court decision that guarantees marriage equality in the U.S., where does the LGBT movement go from here? Come find out at a reception to welcome and honor national leaders in the fight for LGBT religious equality. In 2017, Martin spoke to out at St. Paul on the theme of building bridges to the LGBT community. The pastor at St. Paul the Apostle, Gilbert Martinez, is an adamant supporter of Out at St. Paul, officiating at the yearly Pride Masses, but he was particularly outspoken in his, in his advocacy for the Owning Our Faith video project, which featured many of the Out at St. Paul members offering their testimony on Catholicism and homosexuality. In 2015, Martinez traveled to Rome and personally gave a copy of the video, Owning Our Faith, to both Pope Francis and Cardinal Casper. Here are a few examples of the testimonies and opinions provided in the video. God doesn't make junk. We, we are his creation. And we might not fit into some traditional box of human relationships or, or, or marriage but our energies are real. Our reality is real. And it, it's just a matter of accepting us. You have to, uh, or tolerate us, you have to encourage us to be who we are. We are God's creation. And to deny that is to deny that he knows what the hell he's doing. My gender transition was immensely spiritual to me. Um, it was a journey, I think a lot of people think of this as just a physical journey. And they just look at the physical aspects of transition, but it's an emotional one, it's a spiritual one. I think what's interesting is that the Catholic Church probably thinks 
that it is accepting of gay people because its message is gay people exist and we should love them and not discriminate against them. But because the church also tells gay people essentially that they need to be celibate, what the church is saying is you cannot live fully. You can be gay, but you can't live that life. And so that inherently is discriminatory. A lot of our friends are very critical of us being faithful Catholics because some people in the Catholic Church can take very vocal stances against gays. I like to remind them that according to the Catechism, the Church, with a capital C, is every baptized individual. That includes you, you know, and that includes us. I do more than Matt get frustrated, but he very much espouses that philosophy that he just talked about, right? That, you know, this is the Church, and if anything, I'm going to continue going for this reason because we are the I church. have, you know, faith and hope, and uh, you know, um, he very much is part of it. If we leave it, if we abandon the church, then it's never going to change. Yeah. So we have to continue living here and being an example and encouraging other people to be that example because that's what's going to change the church. You know, they they feel uh, marginalized in many parishes. They I've heard many stories of people being treated poorly um, by parishes by priests priests saying terrible things to LGBT people. The church has been really good at uh, make, writing documents about them, preaching to them, fulminating about them, tweeting about them, condemning them, but they don't listen to them very much. So I think some of that language needs to be retired. I think language like um, objective disorders, those kinds of things are very hurtful for people. Uh, you know, and so a lot of it's how we, how we speak to people as well. Can we be, if, if we're going to treat LGBT people with respect, compassion, and sensitivity, that's part of sensitivity. We should call the LGBT community the LGBT community, or gay, or transgender, you know, not same-sex affliction, stuff like that, which no one uses in the LGBT community. So, so part of that, that's respect, that's sensitivity, that's what the catechism, I mean, hard as it is to hear for some people who might be rolling their eyes, that's what the catechism asks us. In 2016, the dissident group Call to Action started an online petition demanding that language in the catechism be changed. According to the petition, Call to Action calls on officials within the institutional church to open up conversations with LGBTQ communities in order to move the church beyond words and teachings that are openly hostile, arouse anger, and engender deep animosity and pain. Several leaders of Catholic LGBT ministry signed and promoted the petition. But I think the church has a long way to go, frankly. New Way's ministry is a gay affirmative outreach founded by Sister Janine Gramick and Father Robert Nugent. Their rejection of Catholic teachings regarding homosexuality first caught the attention of a few concerned church officials in both the U.S. and at the Vatican shortly after the ministry began in the early 1970s. By 1982, Cardinal James Hickey of Washington contacted the Congregation for Religious and Secular Institutes, requesting that Gramic and Nugent be removed from leadership roles at New Way's ministry. In 1984, both Gramic and Nugent turned New Way's ministry over to lay control, but both continued to write and speak publicly against the teachings of the Church. Subsequently, a lengthy papal investigation was launched that culminated with a 1999 notification, which made the following determination. Given the failure of the repeated attempts of the Church's legitimate authorities to resolve the problems Presented by the writings and pastoral activities of the two authors, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is obliged to declare for the good of the Catholic faithful that the positions advanced by Sister Janine Gramick and Father Robert Nugent regarding the intrinsic evil of homosexual acts and the objective disorder of the homosexual inclination are doctrinally unacceptable because they do not faithfully convey the clear and constant teachings of the Catholic Church in this area. For these reasons, Sister Janine Gramick and Father Robert Nugent are permanently prohibited from any pastoral work involving homosexual persons. While Father Nugent objected to the notification, afterwards he did step back from public ministry. Nugent passed away in 2014. 
As for F Sister Gramic, after the notification, she became even more defiant, stating that, I choose not to collaborate in my own oppression. In 2000, her religious congregation, the School Sisters of Notre Dame, told her to cease speaking publicly on the topic of homosexuality. Gramic rejected the request and then transferred to the Sisters of Loreto, who support her ministry. Since, she continues to write, lecture, and campaign for full inclusion of sexually active homosexuals into the church. In 2011, Gramic stated, But because I know church history, I know change takes centuries. We are planting seeds for change at the upper levels of leadership. She continued, When we started this work, only 20% of Catholics believed in equal rights for gays and lesbians. Now it's over 73%. The church is moving. In a 2011 op-ed for the Washington Post, she wrote, Many Catholics have reflected on the scientific evidence that homosexuality is a natural variant in human sexuality and understand that lesbian and gay love is as natural as heterosexual love. In forming our consciences, Catholics consult scripture and our theological tradition. Here again, there is little firm reason to oppose marriage equality. In 2013, Gramic spoke out publicly in support of Maryland question six or proposition six which legalized same-sex marriage in the state also in 2013 gramic participated in a prayer service outside the supreme court building in support of so-called marriage equality recently the new ways ministry blog expressed disappointment in cardinal vincent nichols the archbishop of westminster and president of the catholic bishops conference of england and wales who they regarded as an ally they wrote, while Nichols may be correct that Christian sexual morality has never been totally accepted in any society, that doesn't mean that Christian sexual ethics hasn't changed as new scientific information and social understandings and customs have evolved. The fact that ethical principles have changed over the centuries is the best argument that they can change in the future. On the homepage of the New Ways Ministry blog, there is a prominent link to an article that they have reprinted, written by Lisa Fulham, who teaches moral theology at the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley. She argues that Catholics should support civil same-sex marriages. Fulham wrote, The goods of marriage are many and varied, but except for the category of possible reproduction with one spouse, same-sex couples are able to participate in them equally with straight couples. Moreover, given what we know about sexual orientation, a ban on marriage for gay and lesbian people would seem, according to church teaching, to abridge a fundamental human right and so constitute an attack on their human dignity. Beyond that, many gay and lesbian couples calling for the right to marry are recalling to our culture the social and cultural importance of marriage. Rather than living quietly in a legally unrecognized state, Gay and lesbian couples asking for marriage affirm the dignity of the institution. Finally, to reject the most intimate relationships of LGBT people as dangerous to the civil polity stoke savage homophobia, which the church opposes. In 2010, Cardinal Francis George, Archbishop of Chicago and President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, issued the following statement on the status of the organization New Ways Ministry. Here is an excerpt. No one should be misled by the claim that New Ways Ministry provides an authentic interpretation of Catholic teaching and an authentic Catholic pastoral practice. Their claim to be Catholic only confuses the faithful regarding the authentic teaching and ministry of the Church with respect to persons with a homosexual inclination. Accordingly, I wish to make it clear that, like other groups that claim to be Catholic but deny central aspects of Catholic teaching, New Ways Ministry has no approval or recognition from the Catholic Church and that they cannot speak on behalf of the Catholic faithful in the United States. For Jesus, more often than not, it is community first, conversion second. Some bishops have already called for us to set aside the phrase objectively disordered, 
when it comes to describing the homosexual inclination. Now the word relates to the orientation, not the person, but it is still needlessly hurtful. Saying that one of the deepest parts of a person, the part that gives and receives love, is disordered in itself, is needlessly cruel. Setting aside such language was discussed at the recent Synod on the Family, according to several news outlets. More recently, an Australian bishop, Vincent Long Van Nguyen, said, quote, We cannot talk about the integrity of creation, the universal and inclusive love of God, while at the same time colluding with the forces of oppression in the ill treatment of racial minorities, women, and homosexual persons. It won't wash with young people especially when we purport to treat gay people with love and compassion and yet define their sexuality as intrinsically disordered, end quote. Part of sensitivity is understanding that. I am a big proponent of parish shopping. I mean, I really am. I know that was verboten when I was growing up, uh, but find a place that is welcoming. I know it's, it's easier in big cities. You know, for example, in New York, I can rat, and even in DC, I can rattle off and Baltimore places that are LGBT friendly. That's very important. Highlight what, highlight five most famous words. Who am I to judge? That changed everything. That was shocking. And you know what I loved about that was that, which I, well, I this is a little schadenfreude, but um, <laughs> when he said that, a, a number of people in the media and commentators said, well, he was only talking about gay priests. So on the next papal uh, trip, someone asked him, were you only talking about gay priests? No, I was talking about everybody, all gay men and women of goodwill. And I thought, good for you. That's what you get for asking that question. Um, I would say most Jesuit parish, well, all Jesuit parishes that I know, you know, are welcoming to LGBT people. That's the first thing. So that's, that's the group I deal with mostly. Um, I think once again, it's a question of explaining. And so when people say, how can you be gay and Catholic? You tell them, this is my experience. You know, I was born this way. I'm baptized Catholic. Uh, I love my church. Here's why I love my church. I don't agree with everything that is going on in my church. I sometimes say to people, are you an American? And they said, do you agree with everything that's going on in the United States? No. Do you love your country? Yes. It's a good analogy for people. How can you stay in the United States if you don't agree with it? Well, I'm, that's, that's who I am. I'm an American. I'm born that way. Well, but, et cetera, right? So to, to kind of use analogies. But you know, um, to really just speak from your heart. I mean, I think that the most authentic and the most authentic evangelization is your own experience. This is what I've experienced. I, you know, I go to this great church and they have a great LGBT group and I love it. And I met this sister who was really kind to me. And have you ever heard of New Ways Ministry? And boy, they're Catholic too. And I love that. And, and you can help open people's minds like that. It, it, is, it is difficult. It is difficult, and it takes a lot of patience. And I think of Jesus. I mean, he wasn't pleasing the religious authorities of his time, and the disciples wanted him to really, like, you know, stir things up. So it's to try to maintain that center. But to always remember that you're baptized and that God called you into the church for a particular reason. You know, and it may be to help change and influence the church. That's the other thing. To see yourself as a leaven, to see yourself as, as part of the change that you want to, to help um, happen in the church. During the final minutes of the question and answer section following Martin's talk, Father Joseph Booth of St. Matthew's Parish in Baltimore asked Martin if he would like to develop a pre cana course for same-sex couples. Muth is active in his parish's gay affirmative outreach called LEAD, which stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Educating and Affirming Diversity. Hi, Father. Uh, I'm Joe Muth. I'm the of the church here in Baltimore. We have a gay men who have been here for about five years. And on Friday... Thank you. On Friday, a two young man... I'm 
Uh oh. So the, the the pastor asked the Jesuit who doesn't work in a parish for advice. Yeah. Yes, Father. What diocese are you in? What does your bishop say? I talk to him a lot about all this. I haven't gotten to that point. Well, I would say, and I'm, I'm not being, I'm not, I'm not trying to be flip with these things, but, um, you know, one works within the confines of, you know, what the, what the ordinary will allow you to do, basically. So you're asking me what I would do. I mean, I'd have to ask my provincial for something like that, because that's really sort of pushing the boundaries. Um, well, let me ask you, but you're the pastor. What, what, what did you say to him? I said, well, um, I worked with one other couple several years ago, and I made them my heterosexual pre marriage steel. And they said, that makes sense to us, it's a relationship. There wasn't anything different that I, that they said that I was telling them that they didn't know. And so that was one part. Then the other thing I said was, we had some older gay couples in the parish. I'd like to refer you to them. They give you the benefit of their experience. And they said, oh, that would be great. We'd love to do that. So I'm going to meet with them on Monday and talk a little bit about what I normally talk to couples in the matter about. And then at some point, I'll turn it over to a couple of days, a couple of days, and maybe a couple of other things, take through a relationship and all that. That would be that. 